Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Good to have you with me once again on Sunday morning. I tell you what, this getting together on Sunday morning is getting to be a pretty big habit, isn't it? I, I wouldn't miss it for anything. You're the people that I love to spend Sunday morning with, especially as we deep dive into some of the things that God is actually teaching and revealing to us today. What I want to do this morning is very simple. I want, to put a, I want to put a measure on the depth of our sonship. You might have noticed the title this morning and it was measuring the depth of your sonship. So I want you to get a good, good grasp this morning on where you're at in this journey of becoming a manifested son of God. And I'd like to do it springing off of a scripture in Acts chapter three. It's a scripture, um, I'm gonna read a lot. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna read it a lot over the next weeks and months probably years that are ahead, uh, because we haven't heard much about it in the past. So I want to get it as, as ingrained in your psyche, into your consciousness, as all those scriptures that we heard for years and years in the church that molded us into something that we had to reprogram and renew our minds away from into what God is doing today. So let's look at Acts chapter 3, verse 20, 21, and then I want you to just listen carefully today. Take a few notes. Maybe come back and listen to it again, and we're going to put a depth. I want you to see where you're at in this journey based upon these two verses. Acts, Acts chapter 3 and verse 20 says this, That he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things. And if you have your Bible, I want you to underline restoration of all things. That is one of the most important phrases in the entirety of the New Testament because it gives us the thrust of what the Spirit of God is doing today in the lives of his sons and daughters. So we're gonna look at the progression of the restoration of all things today and what that looks like and how you and I as maturing sons of God, how we fold into that. I'm not gonna deal with it this morning, but it says, that he, that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restoration. Some morning I'm gonna take up that heaven must receive, and we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna explore that, but that's not my mission this morning. I wanna talk about the restoration of all things, and he, puts, he tells us this about the restoration of all things. The restoration of all things, he finishes the verse by saying it will take place through the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Every promise, every insight, every revelation of every prophet since the world began, every prophetic utterance is going to come to fruition. That's what he's actually saying here. So we're living in that time, I think, when we're seeing the outbreak, when we're seeing the, that initial wave, at least in consciousness, of the restoration of all things. Three things I want you to understand about the restoration of everything, of everything. Number one, it's the heart of the Father. It was his plan, his design, his original intention that there be a certain uh, government, that there be a certain kingdom set forth into the earth, and he has never changed that. Second of all, the restoration of all things is the completion of the kingdom on an earthly level doesn't mean that that kingdom will not continue to, to advance and expand to its full potential, but the restoration of all things will be the completion of the kingdom on the earth. And the third thing I want you to understand is that seeing this through, being part of the restoration of all things is the mission of every son, every manifesting daughter on the planet today. In 2022, sons and daughters have a role, a very vital role. And in, in fact, it's more than vital. It's the access. You are the access upon which this whole promise of God takes place that's given to us in Acts chapter 3, verse 20, 21, the restoration of all things. Now, let me just lay some bases down here. I, I, let, I think we can all agree on this. I want us to see this morning, I want us to grasp firmly and understand that the Father works out his plans, works out his intentions and his desires relationally. He doesn't force it, he works it out relationally with his offspring. Relationship was always the Father's heart from the very beginning, from the time he put the first man on the planet named Adam. He walked with Adam in the cool of the evening. 
if you put fast forward it to Moses, it was God's intention that all the people come up to the top of the mountain to enjoy fellowship with the Father. Every step of the way throughout history, it has been God's intention. It has been his target, his goal, his intention to have relationship with all of us. The relationship that we have with him is very intimate. It's face to face, heart to heart. It is, um, um, you know, it's like a father with his son, father with his children. That's the relationship that we are to have. So out of that intimacy, here's what I'm discovering. Out of that intimacy, the more time that I am able to just spend daily walking with him, making him part of my daily process, just my activities. I drive my car to the gym in the morning. I don't listen to uh, the radio anymore. I just carry on a conversation about the plans for the day, what I'd like to do, uh, what he wants me to teach on, if there's things that I'm missing that he wants me to implement. It's just a running conversation. I think that's the intimate fellowship that he designed and desired for all of us. And out of that intimate fellowship comes a real sense of the mission that he has for your life. Now, Jesus had a mission, and, and that came out of, I believe, spending time with the Father. I think when Jesus went off by himself, he and the Father ironed out the plans, uh, ironed out the, the targets that he was heading for at that particular time in his ministry, and all of that arose out of the time that Jesus spent with the Father. Jesus' mission was clear, very clear. Everything he did was to, to seek and to save that which was lost. Number one message that Jesus taught everywhere he went. He had one message. It was the kingdom. And arising out of that kingdom to, to, to push the boat off shore, so to speak, was his seeking and saving that which was lost. You and I have a mission. You have a, All of us have a little bit different part in that mission, but he's going to disclose to you the part that you play in this mission. And the mission we have in the restoration of all things is very simply to bring every principality, every power, every dominion under the government of Jesus. That is the kingdom. That is the fulfillment and the completion of the kingdom. When you spend time with the Father, He's going to impress you with the idea that you are a heir of the Father's creation, all of it. That was, that was the design, that you are the heir of all creation. We're going, to, we're going to read it in just a couple of minutes from Scripture, but that plan has never changed. We've got joint airship with him, and he has given us responsibility. If you go back to the very beginning, he gave us the responsibility on earth to bring maturity into the earth through the installation of the government of God over all. Let me, let me just show you how this thing's going to break out. Let me show you how, how it's all going to come down. Now, this is contrary to what we have been taught in church but this, this is the plan, and this is the plan, and I'm really excited about doing this teaching this morning because I think this is a right now word. I think this is right on the cusp of where he has us at the Digital Cathedral as well as other people around the world. I think he's got us right now where we're beginning to understand what it is that he's trying to accomplish and how it's going to look as it progresses and what the finalization of it will be, and it's entirely different than what we were drilled on in church for all of our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22. Let me read this. I'm going to go down through verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. It says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ will all be made alive. That is, that's the way it's going to come down. There's not going to be anybody lost. There's not going to be anybody that can claim to be found in Adam. Everyone will be in last Adam. Every person that died in Adam will be made alive in Christ, but each one in his own order. That's what we're walking through today. It says each one in his own order. The reason some of your relatives, the reason some of your church friends have not uh, awakened to what you see, that aren't walking where you walk, is because it's not their time. He says very clearly, each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. That doesn't mean he's going to split the eastern skies and all of a sudden in a split second, everybody will be, will be um, different. That word um, um, at, at his coming could, could better be interpreted at his unveiling. At his unve as he is unveiled. Uh, 1 John, what is it? 1 John chapter 2 or 1 John chapter 3. 
John says, Beloved, it has not appeared yet what we shall be. But we know this, that when Jesus is revealed, we shall be just like him. And that's not talking about a second coming. It's talking about revelation. As The more revelation, the more finely tuned revelation you get about Jesus, the more you see yourself. You want to know who you are? Look at Jesus. He is an exact prototype of humanity. He came to show us to ourselves. That was his purpose. So there's an order to this. Now watch verse 24. Then comes the end. So his, his uh, coming is not the end. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God. Jesus delivers the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he puts down all rule and all authority and all power. That's every resistant force to the restoration of everything. For he must reign, and he is reigning. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Boy, I'm going to take that one on in 2023. There's a lot I want to say about this enemy death. Death is not our friend. Death is not the friend of God. Death was never designed or intended for us. And death is going to be destroyed. I got a lot I want to say about that in 2023. Verse 27, For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things under him. And when all things are made subject to him, or when everything is restored, when everything is back in its proper orders, the restoration of all things is about putting things back in order. It's about making that which is wrong right. The justice of God, the justice of God is not vengeance. The justice of God is not anger. The justice, the real definition of justice is setting back in order that which is out of order, making that right which was not right. Verse 27, he's put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident he, Jesus, is accepted who put all things under him. And when all things, verse 28 says, are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. Watch, that God, listen, listen, that God may be all in all. This, these verses right here, this is explaining to us what the, what, how it's all going to come down, how it's all going to take place. Let me read that for you out of the Passion Translation. Passion Translation says it really well. I'm, I'm sorry I'm taking a little bit of time to read scripture this morning, but I want you to see the target, the goal of what the restoration of all things is, is about, how it looks, how, how it's going to transpire, how it's going to develop as it takes place. Then the final stage of completion comes when he will bring an end to every other rulership, authority, and power and he will hand over his kingdom to the Father God. Until then, he is destined to reign as king until all hostility has been subdued and placed under his feet. Verse 26, and the last enemy to, sub, to be subdued and eliminated. Wow, I like that. And eliminated is death. The Father has placed all things in subjection under the feet of Christ, yet when it says all things, it is understood that the Father does not include himself, for he is the one who placed all things in subjection to Christ. However, however, when everything is sub subdued and in submission, see we're talking about the restoration of all things. This is how it's looking. This is what, what it's going to come down to. I know it doesn't look like it now. The world is out of order. The, order. the world is full of chaos. The world is shaking. And that's that's a necessary step that we have just got to simply go through. Hebrews says everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that which cannot be shaken will remain. You and I are in this generation that we are going to go through some shaking. We might as well make up our minds to it. It's just part of the process. Trust the process. However, when everything is subdued and, and submission to him, then the son himself will be subject to the father who put all things under his feet. This is the last, last sentence. This is so that the father God will be everywhere in everything and in everyone. Man, that... Uh, you got to be blind in one eye and can't see out of the other to, to miss what that scripture is saying. You need your evangelical pastor to help you to, to not understand that. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 22 to 28 are worthy of your pondering. They're worthy of your meditation. 
This is what the restoration of all things looks like. So we, we have, a, we have a, a, a thrust. We have a place where we're headed. And it is the submission of every principality, every power, every ruler, every dominion to come under the feet of Christ. Under the feet. The feet's in the body. So you're an integral part of this. I got a lot more to say about that this morning because I want you to measure where you're at in this journey, where you're at in the walk. And I want to whet your appetite. I want you to get a hunger to be part of the restoration of all things. Now this 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it's very fair to say, follows on the heels of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Let me, let me read this. This is, what, this, is what's ha this is what we kind of have seen happening, and I think we're a little bit on the tail end of this right now. Um, it's, it's not, I can't say it's fully completed or fully matured, but I think we have seen, we understand some of this here in Ephesians 4. Now, Ephesians 4, 12 to 16, I think is the initial stages of getting to 1 Corinthians 15. He's whetting our appetite. He's whetting our appetite when we read 1 Corinthians 15. And I, I, I want you, to, here's the process. Here's the process. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. He, he says, let me, let me start with verse 11. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, the maturing of the saints, to bring us into the place of maturity, for the work of ministry. The saints are to do the work of the ministry, not the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They are to build leaders. The fivefold, the path, if a pastor is, is building followers, he's missed his call. If a prophet is building followers, he's missed his call, or an apostle. The job of an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is to build leaders for the work of the ministry. You may not oversee a church or a, a large ministry of public, public use, but you're going to be an intricate part of this ministry. The, the, those five are not to build followers. They are to mature people for the work of the ministry for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Most of us are going to be in a position where we are to edify, build up, strengthen the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith, not unity of theology, not unity of doctrine, but unity of the faith. Faith works by love, so we're talking about love here, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what's going on today in the body of Christ is we are at least paying some lip service to the idea and the concept that we are to rise to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's big. That's huge. As we come into that place, then we can begin to walk in our position, in the mission we have, which is to be instrumental in the restoration of all things. When we come to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, we seat ourselves, heavenly places, next to Jesus, and we begin to legislate and establish the kingdom in full manifestation on the earth. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the constitution of the kingdom called Sermon on the Mount. Want to know how the kingdom functions? Read those three chapters. There's tremendous insight into attitudes, actions, behaviors of the manifested sons of God as they instill the kingdom. The Father's will and the Father's purpose has always been kingdom. It has always been peace. And that is to be delivered and manifested fully through his sons, through his sons and daughters. Isaiah chapter 9. Let me read this out of the Old Testament. I don't read Old Testament too much. I want you to see this. Isaiah had an insight on this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. Isaiah 9, 7. It says, of the increase of his government. That's, that's his rule. That's his kingdom. His kingdom is his government. Of the increase of his government and peace. The government is instilled through peace and love and joy. The fruit of the Spirit demonstrating through the manifested sons of God have a profound effect upon culture. Profound effect. I'm going to, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about the um, impact that your identity as divinity has on, on nature. You affect nature, and that's part of the restoration of all things. It includes nature, the entire cosmos. 
Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it. This is our job, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. That doesn't mean that we come in condemning and ridiculing and putting down. It means that we, we set ourselves in a place where we can begin to make uh, the wrongs right. Now he said, he said, he's talking about the kingdom and the government increasing, right? And there'll be no end to it. Jesus said it a little bit different in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I love this stuff. I really do. I hope I hope I can ins inspire you this morning a little bit because we're we're engaged in this. This is where the heartbeat of the Father is. This is you want to know what your mission is, what what what, what your call is. I, I don't care if you're flipping hamburgers at McDonald's or you're selling cars or insurance, you're a school teacher, lawyer, doctor. I don't care what you are. This is your mission. It's to plug in and let him disclose to you the part that you play in the restoration of all things. Now, here's what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom which comes from heaven, from within, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the entire lump was leavened. That means, that means the lump was, was permeated with the leaven. That means the leaven went to work, went to work within that lump and it expanded and grew until the entire lump was leavened. Now let me just stop right here and catch my breath. Everything that I have said up to this point, for the most part, has been ignored and never taught in the church. You never heard about the restoration of all things in the church. Chances are your pastor never taught from Acts chapter 3, verse 20, 21. I grew up in church. I never heard a message about it. In all my years in education, I never heard a professor talk about Acts chapter 3. Never heard a chapel service. Never heard every, uh, an evangelist. Never heard anybody talk about the restoration of all things. Never heard them talk about leavening the lump with the concept that the kingdom would, would entirely take over the entire lump. Never heard anybody break down Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, that this kingdom was going to increase and increase. It's already objectively as big as it'll ever be, but now we're subjectively beginning to take our part in this as sons and daughters of God, and we're beginning to put boots on the ground and walk this thing out. Most everything that I've, I've, I've taught up to this point, you've never heard, maybe some of you never heard before. If you've been with me at the Digital Cathedral, you know that we have talked about the restoration of all things, and we will continue to, because I think it's the call of the hour. I think it's the call of the day. And the reason we never heard about it in church is because the emphasis was not on the kingdom, not on kingdom now. Back in the 90s, there was a wave that came through of teaching on kingdom now. And my gosh, I tell you what, it faced opposition like you would not believe because nobody wanted the kingdom to be now. The kingdom would not be established till Jesus came back. Okay, so we never heard about kingdom now. And when that, when that, when that teaching came through the body of Christ, some of you were probably in a charismatic church, Pentecostal church. And, and you remember some of that, Earl Polk, and there were a number of other people, Miles Monroe, that begin to talk about kingdom. Now, boy, it was resisted. Do you know why? Because we didn't emphasize the kingdom. What we emphasized was the rapture. We emphasized the rapture. The rapture and the concept of an ever-increasing kingdom that does what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 to 28, that brings into subjection every dominion, every power, every authority in the earth under, under the auspices, under the, the feet of Jesus, that goes in conflict against the rapture. Because the rapture says the world is going to get worse and worse and worse and darker and darker. And just before we're sucked down the train, Jesus comes back and rescues us. And then there's seven years of tribulation. I mean, things really get bad. And the whole teaching was, if Jesus doesn't rescue us, then we're doomed. If Jesus doesn't rescue us, there's no hope. We heard nothing about victorious kingdom. We heard nothing about Jesus taking a kingdom that had been totally subdued and under, and under the reign of the kingdom and handing that kingdom over to the Father, and the Father becoming all in all, 
All we heard was a last second exit. All we heard was a last second hope that saved us. Oh, hallelujah, saved us from a powerful devil and all of his minions. What it? it was a total message of defeat. Then Jesus would ride back. You know, Jesus had a big tattoo on his hip on a white horse and would slay all those people that had given the Christians such a hard time. He would just, he, in anger, he would take out his vengeance on them. But poor old Jesus, he couldn't compete with the devil. He couldn't compete. He couldn't compete with first Adam and his influence. First Adam was so much greater than last Adam. First Adam caused everybody to fall, but last Adam couldn't get everybody redeemed and saved and justified. It was too much of a mission. And so there's just a little handful, maybe 10% of us, it was taught that at the end of the day, this devil that had been totally defeated in the evangelical church readily admitted that at the cross, Jesus made a show of the devil openly triumphing parading him through as a defeated foe. But somehow this devil resurrected and became so powerful that he ended up with the majority of humanity and Jesus had, and the Father had just a little dribble over here. Can you see what a bunch of poppycock and baloney that is? I want to use a stronger phrase, but I'm not going to do it. Can you see how crazy that is? That's what we had. So nobody talked about kingdom. It, it was never even considered. The things I'm telling you this morning, and this is why I'm going over it and over it and over it for the next months, because I feel within that you and I are at, at the verge of that. We've come through somewhat the Ephesians 4, the maturing of the saints by the apostle, prophet of edges, pastor and teacher. And the good, good apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers have not been building followers. They have been they have been injecting, they have been feeding, they have been imparting and imputing into people what they're going to need to have to fulfill the part that they are to play in this restoration of all things that we read so clearly from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. So our primary purpose is this. It's the outworking of the Father's original plan in desire and intention, and He lives it through our lives just as he did through the life of Jesus. The, rest, the restoration of everything that he is, is what he created, we're coming back to what he created in the original design and in the original purpose. And I wanna read that to you, because you've heard it, but I don't think we've made a connection between what he did originally and where we're at today in bringing the two together, because the Father's plan has never changed. Father's, Father's vision has, has never vanished. It's never, it's never been thrown off course. So let me, re, let me read this for you out of, out of Genesis chapter 1. And, and you've heard it all your life. But I want, I want you to hear it with a renewed impact on what I'm teaching on this morning, which is the restoration of everything. Here's, here's what's going to be restored. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We, we're getting some of that restoration out of the image and the likeness of God. We're beginning to say, yeah, that's our identity. Our identity is image and likeness of God. That's a big breakthrough. That's huge. That never would have been taught in church that we are presently today. What we were taught presently today, we're in the image and likeness of Adam. We've got that old man nature. No, my old man was crucified with Christ. I don't have an old man. I'm sorry I don't have an old man. I'm a new creation, thank you very much. Let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. That's why I said that he has given us responsibility over creation, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the, over, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I hear people all the time saying, why does God allow so much evil? Why does God so allow so much hurt and poverty and, and, and starvation in the world? I think God folds his hands and looks at us and says, why do you allow it to happen? I'll tell you why, because we've never been taught. This has never taken a foothold in the church. As, as, as the people of God, as sons of God, we never were taught over all the earth. Are you serious? Are you serious? This is, this is late breaking news, brother, that we have responsibility. God has given to us the responsibility. The ball's in our court. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. 
male and female, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Subdue it. Have dominion over the birds, over the fish, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion. Take charge. Bring it back to where it should be. That was his charge. And this, this wonderful, intimate relationship that we have with the Creator is how he leads us and guides us and brings us into revelation and knowledge on how to get this thing done. We're right in step where we need to be today. The restoration that is taking place is a restoration that we lost through the do-it-yourself tree. That's what Adam introduced to the human race, is the do-it-yourself tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree, trying to figure out and do it on our own through what we thought, what our intellect told us, what our senses, has caused bondage. It's caused a loss of identity. We lost our identity. It started with Adam when, when he tried to become something he already was to get something he already had. And Adam passed it down from generation to generation. It's come down to our generation. We're finally breaking that thing. We're finally breaking that thing, right? We, we were never wired to live by the DIY tree. We were never wired to live by the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We were wired to live from the tree of life. And God set us in that position in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. We just read what his intention was in Genesis 1. I, I don't have time to get into it, but I think that was in God's imagination in Genesis chapter 1. I can't prove it. That's just my opinion. Don't take it as gospel or doctrine. I think he, he said, let us do this, let us do this. And then it was in chapter 2, verse 7, that he actually formed man and breathed in, into him the breath of life. That breath of life connected him once and for all to the tree of life. It was God's life. It was the very essence of God that he blew, blew into our, our nostrils. So as we restore sonship, as we come into this place where we understand who we are, what, we, what we've been equipped with, and, and how we are to demonstrate it, all of creation itself begins to recognize what it has been groaning for, what it's been looking for, right? The ball, the ball is in our court. I don't, I, and that's not to put guilt or condemnation on us. It's just to say this is the route, the path that we have to go. But until we acknowledge who we are, until we acknowledge what our mission is, until we know definitively that we are sons of God, daughters of God, walking on this planet. Deception, maybe deception is the wrong word. Let me say ignorance. Ignorance is going to keep all those things that we have in our mission is going to keep it behind a veil of darkness. Now do you see why Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 16, he said, you are the light of the world. You don't take a, a candle and put it under a bushel. You put it on a hill. You let it expose. See, darkness has no power. Darkness is simply the absence of light. The purpose of light is to, is to eliminate the darkness. You go into a dark room, you turn the light on. The purpose of that light is to dispel the darkness. And the darkness goes that quick when light comes on. John said in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 9, he said, verse 4 and verse 9, he said, I think it's verse 4, Jesus is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. And he, and he, and he, and he went on to say that you and I have this Jesus light. Do you, do you think the light, if Jesus is the light of every man that comes into the world, do you think the light that we have is different than his light? Is it of a different quality? Is it of a different strength? Does he, does he have a 100-watt bulb and we've only got a 40-watt bulb? See, People, and I have found this so true, and I've, I've hit my head against the wall more than one time on this, people even in gray circles get nervous, really nervous, when you start exploring the depths of sonship. What a son of God really, really entails. What the potential is what has been given to us. 
the, the, the light himself is beginning to penetrate our darkened understanding. And when that light comes in our darkened understanding, you know what? Light begins to flood us. And that, we've been afraid, I, people even in gray circles are afraid of deception. They still are carrying that burden. They're afraid of deception as far as this issue of sonship. It, it, it's, it's, like, it's like there's this built-in fear of how powerful we really are. This light that we have within us, this Jesus light, how bright it really can be. We get, people in finished works are, they're afraid of this. They're afraid of it. And, and it's because we want to control. We want to keep that control on how much we can do, how wide we can really go. We're afraid of losing control. I mean, there's a serious fear of that still within the people of God that we, if we really explored it, we really pushed it out there, we'd be out of control. For example, let me give you a couple of scriptures. This will illustrate what I'm trying to get across. For example, the scripture says, and we, we, we say we believe this, but we're afraid to run it out to its logical conclusion. Scripture says all things are possible to him that believes. Do you really believe that? Do you live like that or do you live under a restraint of what you still perceive as possible? Scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can, do you really believe you can do all things through Christ? Do you really believe that, that that's, that's the limit? All things are possible. I can do all things through Christ. Under, under, your, under your current understanding, would you really say you grasp that? Would you really say, uh, and, and, okay, the second part, are you living it out? Are you walking it out? Creation will never get free. We will never see the freedom of creation, what creation is groaning and crying for. The kingdom will not prevail until, listen to me closely, until we take the lid off the potential of the manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. You cannot take sonship too far. You cannot take love too far. You cannot take grace too far. Ephesians chapter 1. I hope I'm blowing your mind a little bit this morning. I have a feeling I am. I'm having a feeling that some of you don't like what you're hearing this morning because it's pushy. It's making you uncomfortable. When you teach on potential, when you teach on really who we are, See, we're, we're satisfied with what we, we've got this far, but it's more than that. It's more than we've envisioned. I'm telling you, it's way beyond. The new creation is something way beyond anybody has even taught up to this level. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. I'm going to, show, I'm going to just show you what, what the potential of this is. He's put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things. Watch head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church, not the building, not the, not the system, not the denomination, people, ecclesia, the called out ones. We are his body, watch. The fullness of him, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word fullness there is, is the Greek word pleroma, pleroma. You know what it means? It means fullness, completion or some total. Let me just plug some total in there for just a minute, which is his body, the sum total of him. The body of Christ is the sum total of him who fills all in all. Every part of the body has a different function. I call it Paul called it a measure of rule. He said, I won't stretch myself beyond my measure of rule. There's a measure of rule that all of us function in. But the hand, here's the point I'm trying to make. The hand has the same essence. It has the same DNA as the foot. The big toe has the same DNA, has the same quality, the same essence as the head. He is the head of the body, the church, the fullness of him, the fullness of it, the completion of him, the sum totality of him. I'm telling you this morning, our position is blessed way beyond measure. And do you know why we're blessed beyond measure? So that we can bless other people. So that we can bless other people. You have freely received. You have received so much. I mean, man, we are blessed people. We have received so much. So much revelation, so much understanding. 
there's so much more out there for us. I don't have to, I don't have to teach the same sermon every week with a different title. There is so much out in front of us that we can explore and walk into that it's, that it's marvelous. We have received so much and we've received so much so that we can dispense so much. You can't give more than what you have. Reason your pastor down there at the Charismatic Church teaches the same message every week, slaps a different title on it, but basically has the same emphasis, is because that's all he's got. That's all he's got in the bucket. That's all he's got in the basket. That's not the way it is here with you and me. You have got so much. And you demonstrate it on the Zoom on Wednesdays and Fridays. You pour out and pour. You're, you're, you're an awesome group of people. And you understand why, why you have, have what you have. See, here's, we're coming to kind of a conclusion that all of creation is in covenant. We're not in competition. We're not in competition. You have received grace. You set the limits on how much grace that you received. Did you, did you know that? You set the limits on how much revelation you received. I, I don't set it for you. You set it. Can I tell you how much grace is working in your life today? There's a whole lot out there. I'm going to tell you how much. This, here's a measure for you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given. Everybody's got grace. According to the measure of Christ's gift. Each one of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the question is this morning, how big do you measure the gift of Christ? What limits do you put on? What parameters do you put on what he has imputed and deposited into your life? Can you really do all things through him? Everything, everything I talked about is a result of being in Christ. I'm not talking about you as an independent person off doing your thing. I'm talking about because you are in Christ. Do you really believe that all things are possible? Do we live like it? Are we willing to, to jump into something when we don't know exactly what we're jumping into because we're not afraid any longer because we know all things are possible? All of us have received grace. Here's your measure. The measure is the gift of Christ. How, how big of a measure you put on the gift? I'll tell you this, as, as your measure of the gift grows, the grace that you understand you have imputed to your life also grows. We all can get it because in this new covenant, we are all included through Jesus. It's not based on division. It's not based on haves, have nots. It's not based on insiders, outsiders. There's no separation with nationality. There's no separation based on education or, or culture. It's based on one family. Ephesians 4, 6 says that there's one God and Father of all who's above all, through all, and in all. That's the Father's view of humanity. He doesn't see Baptist sons. He doesn't see Presbyterian daughters. He doesn't see charismatic sons and daughters. He doesn't see just those that prayed the magic prayer sons and daughters. He doesn't see just sons and daughters that receive Jesus into their heart as his personal Savior. He sees all. He is the Father of all, that verse says. There's no separation based on anything. There's only one family. It's, it's the family of mankind. There's only one race, the human race. There is no separation. There is no difference. Christ is expressed as one man with one body, and there's no separation between the little toe, the hand, the arm, the kidney, the neck, the head, the ear. They're all connected together. Some of you are looking at me like, I didn't know that. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And let me read just two verses real quick. Verse 10, verse 11. It says, And put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Put on the new man, one new man. That's where we're all together. Which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So that new man is going to look just like the one that created us. We're coming back to that. We're, we're, we're discarding this thing, whether we're black, white, brown, yellow, purple. Doesn't matter. We are renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him that created him, whether there is neither Greek nor Jew. You get it? Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. No difference, no separation. One race, the human race, but Christ is all and in all. So we're being renewed. We're being renewed in the knowledge of our mind for something to be renewed that had to one time be new. This had to be the way that it was one time to be renewed. 
You cannot renew a piece of furniture unless one time it was new. You can't restore an automobile unless one time it, it was just created perfectly. And now you're putting it back in its original condition. We're, we're, we are regaining slowly and surely what we forgot. It's always been that we forgot it. We've walked in darkness. We've walked in ignorance. We're being renewed back to the original design that the designer who looked at creation, looked at creation and said, man, this stuff's pretty good. He said, it's not only good, it's very good. So if there's no separation, there's no Jew, no Greek, no black, no white, no brown, no yellow, one new man in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 really nails it down. If you got trouble understanding Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 and 11, which I don't think you can misunderstand it, let me read again. There's neither Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave of three, but Christ is all and in all. Let me, if, if, if you have trouble with that one, let me give you Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll just read one verse for sake of time this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. The one man that he created is the family of God from Jew and Gentile. From Jew and Gentile. There's no more Jew and Gentile. There's no more black, white. You get it? I mean, this is, it, this is the restoration. When God created and made man his image and likeness, you think he made black, white? I, do you think? I, I don't know. I don't know what he made, but I'll tell you this, it doesn't make much difference today because he's renewing us to image and likeness, identity of divinity. Now, if that ain't good news, if that ain't good news, I don't know what is. If that doesn't spur us and, and, and ignite within us a hunger to fill our, our place in this mission of the restoration. See, that's all been restored objectively. It's, it's over. It's a done deal. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was finished. It now becomes a matter of us awakening to what is subjectively to be lived out. This is what we're learning today. We're learning to live out objective, subjectively what I've been teaching this morning. That is an objective fact. It's an objective reality. It's a done deal. In, in, in the practical application, teaching today has got to be very practical. I don't think people are interested in theology and doctrine as much as they are. Tell me how to manifest as a son. Show me how to fulfill my call for what God has in my life to fit into the body where I need to be. Subjectively, boots on the ground, practical teaching, to what Jesus objectively cried, it is finished to, that's where the body of Christ is at today. That's one reason why um, uh, quantum physics is having such an impact on the body. The quantum, quantum physics, I actually believe, is the science of the kingdom. And the, thing that is being, and the things that are being revealed and taught, Steve McVeigh does a wonderful job over on his group every, every morning about breaking quantum physics down into the life of, of the spirit, into living it out as, as a believer. In other words, what, what, what's remaining right now is living this thing out. It's, it's practically walking it out. In the kingdom, we are all equally important. That's what I'm trying to drive home this morning. And in that equal importance comes the mission, comes, comes the, 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 the vision to be able to manifest as a son of God with a purpose. And that is to see the restoration of everything that every prophet spoke since time began, putting this thing back in perfect repair, everything under the subjection of Jesus. He hands it back to the Father. And that, that's, what, that's the point at which every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Things above the earth, in the earth, under the earth makes no difference. All, all will be in him. That's the end of the game, you guys. And throughout eternity, Paul said, it will take God to unwind the, his goodness and his love and his grace toward us in Christ Jesus. People perish 
or they remain disconnected from life, not by a big devil, not by all his dominions, whatever you think the devil is. My, my, my mind's changed a lot on what the devil is. I'm not going to tell you what it is. doesn't matter. Whatever you think the devil is, the devil is not in control. People perish or remain disconnected from life, not by a big devil and all of his minions, but from a lack of conveyed revelation and understanding from the one who walked this out so we could see what it looked like. Jesus walked this out in daily life so we could see what a kingdom man looked like, how a kingdom man responded to adversity, how a kingdom man responded to enemies, how he responded to one that rebuked him, how he lived his life out in connection with the Father in with total supply for every need that he had. There's not one day's recorded Jesus walked in sickness or COVID-19 or, or any other nonsense. The manifestation of the sons of God is to bring the restoration, not only of the government and the oversight of God, but to bring peace and health and prosperity back to the human race. There's enough for everybody. Do you think my God cannot supply every need of every person, of every nation? It's been our greed. It's been our inability to adapt ourselves. It's been the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to do it yourself, to claw, to get ahead, to step on other people. I believe, I, I sincerely believe that the restoration of sonship means that we can be restored. Some of you may disagree with this. We can be restored to the fullness of who we were as spirit beings before we ever took on this flesh. I think we were in the mind of the Father before we ever were sent to the planet. We were always in the mind of God. We were placed in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. He, he knew Don Keithley and put me in Christ before the foundation of the world. I, I was there when, he, when the foundation came. I was there when the light it, it came into the darkness. The whole of creation is looking and longing for freedom. The cloud of witnesses is cheering us on so that they can be set free. Proverbs says, or um, Hebrew says that they are not made complete. Their race is not finished without us. Our call, listen, our call, and I hope you put a little measure on how big you think Christ's gift is, because however you measure it, I want you to make it bigger. I want you to see yourself bigger. I want sonship to grow in your eyes and understanding. I don't care what people say to you. I want you to begin to see that the, the DNA, the very life, the essence of the Father flows through you. And we've got to come to an understanding of who we are as sons on this planet. If we are going to see the plan of God fulfilled and not have to fall in for this malarkey of a rapture and, and God getting us out in the middle of the night, sneaking us out just before we go down to defeat, our call is to be an ambassador for reconciliation and the restoration of all things. You, my friend, are a mover and a shaker in the kingdom. Don't ever deny it. You're a mover and a shaker bringing restoration. You're a mover and a shaker bring, bringing back to completion everything exactly as it should be. So you know what I say to you this morning? I say let's do this thing together. Let's keep doing this journey. Let's keep doing life together. Let's keep watching the kingdom grow bigger and bigger in our awareness and in our understanding. My time is up this morning. I actually went a little bit over, forgive me. I get so wound up on this stuff. The, the stuff that's really current going on today, I, it, it just charges my batteries. It, it rings my bell. And I love to share with you because I believe that you have the same heart that I do. You want all that you can get a hold of and you want to take as many with you as you possibly can. Thank you for being with me this morning. Next week, we're going to pick up on some stuff that I think you're really going to enjoy. I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But we're going to do a couple of parts on some little deeper living stuff. So I want you to join me. Don't forget, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Central for The Secret Place. And I'll unwind a little bit more about the restoration. See you then. God bless. Have a great week. And don't forget, you are a mover and a shaker. Amen. God bless.